Hello everyone. Welcome to this digital platform of Drishti IS. We are organizing a special lecture series on various segments of general studies. In the recently concluded civil services mains examination, the questions which have been asked in various segments of general studies syllabus, we are trying to uh, provide an insight, an enlightenment, and especially for those candidates who are not uh, living in Delhi, who don't have access to these well refined resources, they should also be able to encapsulate, they should also be able to analyze what is the nature of this examination, what kind of questions did UPSC ask. So, all these queries, questions we try to answer and I am Sharat Tripathi, I will be dealing with questions related to international relations which have been appeared in recently concluded mains examination. So, the first and the foremost thing, it is a macro trend, uh, you can say analysis. If we look at the weightage of questions which have come in international relations, so you will find that it is almost a static all these years. 50 marks questions you will see in this segment of international relations. But in order to give you a better understanding of international relations and its correlation with civil services examination. Let me uh, provide a broader picture of a macro trend analysis as far as international relations are concerned. So, let us get into this macro trend analysis. And in this macro trend analysis, the first thing that we should uh, understand is how can we overall dissect the syllabus of international relations. So, let us in a very in a very basic way, IR the syllabus can be further segregated into four components. First one we can say the foundation principles of international relations. Many a times you will get questions with respect to terms like balance of power, geopolitics, geo strategy. Then there may be like some uh, institutional efforts like League of Nations why League of Nations failed basically. So, all these things they are related to the foundation of this subject and foundation also because this is a technical subject political science and international relations, but in general studies this foundation should be very very uh, you can say very uh, brief it should not be you should not get into deep study because general studies is different from the technical domain of political science. So, foundation principles and let us also include foreign policy, foreign policy and foundation principles. Together they create the first dimension of our syllabus. Second thing, second aspect of international relations is India and its neighbors, India and its neighbors. Third part of this syllabus is we can say India and world. Now, India and world can also be treated like a neighbors, they are also part of world, but once we have created a separate chapter for India, India and its neighbors, 
then India and world it means India's relations vis a vis other important global participants like US, like Japan, like France, Australia, all other major global players. So, dynamics of India's relationship with such countries we will tackle in this section India and the world. We can also include some prominent institutions or groupings in this segment. Institutions, it may be like United Nations, it may be other specialized agencies like World Bank, Bretton Woods Institutions, World Bank, IMF, it can include IAEA, all such aspects. But obviously, foreign policy also caters to this section. So, while addressing this syllabus also, when we teach, we include major institutions like the regional groupings of SARC and BIMSTEC and international grouping, the most prominent one being United Nations. We include it in foreign policy. But rest, all the contemporary developments, all the recent formulations, we can always include it in this section. So, this becomes the third pillar of our syllabus. The fourth aspect with respect to this macro analysis is we can say international affairs, international affairs or we can say international issues also is one word which is used and primarily we uh, study various crises which are taking place across the globe like recently Russia, Ukraine, war or the tension which is sort of build up is building up in this China Sea with respect to China and Taiwan. Uh, in that crisis, US is also a big stakeholder. So, all such developments which are happening on day to day basis, they can be treated in this pillar. So, this is we can say the decoding of our subject, our topic is basically in these four pillars. Now, why? We should know this. We are here to analyze paper. Why are we analyzing the syllabus? Because once you are well versed with these dissectional aspects of your syllabus, then only you can relate to the trend of the paper. That what exactly is the trend? Questions kaha se are? What is the, you can say, the nerve point of uh, this section? UPSC, uh, how is it, how is UPSC basically treating this subject? What is the focal point? So, all those things we can only analyze once we have a brief understanding of this syllabus. Now, this is again, uh, you can say, a tabular form uh, of analyzing that in different years, like from 2017 to 2020 onwards. What is the focus of UPSC? What have been the stress areas of our syllabus? So, it is divided in three parts, India and its neighbors, then bilateral, regional, global groupings, impact of policies and then important in international institutions. This is another way of representing the syllabus. This is what UPSC has provided actually. This is the UPSC way of presenting the syllabus. I have made it simple for you because uh, it's for especially for new students, new candidates, it's difficult to understand this jargon. So, if we want to simplify, we can understand the whole thing in these four aspects. Fine. Now, let us move further in analyzing the trend of this exam apart from this tabular representation, the macro trend analysis on the basis of this year's mains exam. Let us further create some dimensions to this. First one is the weightage thing. In trend and always, rem always remember that trend is your friend. In this examination, if you are following the trend, if you can capture those 
uh, small things which UPSC is basically doing, then only you can beat this exam. So, weightage is one important macro factor which we should always keep in mind. It means what is the weightage of this segment because ultimately that will help you decide how much time you will devote for that particular segment. Overall, the biggest resource in this examination for any civil services aspirant is time and everyone has same time. Now, in strategizing your preparation, you have to allocate the time as per the weightage of any particular topic. So, when we talk about IR, weightage is more or less, we have seen in that uh, bar diagram, the weightage is of 50 marks and more or less it remains constant in all these years. Okay. So, after 2013 when there was a major shift in the scheme of examination, this weightage of IR is more or less 50 marks in GS paper 2. At times, you will find a question in first paper also because first paper there is a segment which is related to history, it is called post independence history of India. There you will find questions because post independence history it includes everything. It includes the major economic events in the country, it includes major political events. So, it also includes major international political events like they have asked question on Tashkand agreement, uh, on Shimla agreement, there is a question on Siachen crisis. So, these things they can also appear, but uh, conceptually we should be clear that in second paper where this uh, IR is basically the syllabus uh, is uh, involved. So, in second paper we will have 50 marks worth question about IR. The second dimension which is associated with this macro trend is more or less the structural part. Structural analysis of this segment. Structural analysis means once you know that okay, this particular segment has weightage of 50 marks, then how many questions? What is the word limit? That makes a structure of a paper. Luckily for you guys who are giving exam in this era, the structure is also more or less it has become constant you will have set number of questions and generally you will have questions in 150 words and 250 words. Okay. The total number it is also almost 20 questions you get. So, structurally also trend says that in IR you will have two questions of 150 words and they have a weightage of 10 mark and then two questions of 250 words weightage of 15 marks. So, in all you will have 50 marks question. So, this, this structural thing is also this year, this year means it is also remain same as in previous years. Third aspect of this macro trend analysis is topical analysis. Topical analysis means since subject is broadly, we have divided it into four parts. So, is UPSC uh, basically uh, is giving a stress or importance to all these parts equally or some of these parts they are important. It can also be a transition thing that in previous years some certain topic, some certain segment of a syllabus was given more importance and this year the whole dimension has changed. These things they also come under this analysis part. So, we will analyze that also. So, topically we can say there is a big change which uh, we have witnessed this year because you will see in this table also. See, in from 2019 to 2021, there were no questions from neighborhood. Of this itself is 
a very striking thing because a country who is pursuing neighborhood first policy and in your exam there are absolutely no questions with respect to your neighbors so what has happened is when the questions aane band ho jate hain so candidates they have a general tendency that sir this is become redundant and you are uh, taking maximum classes on this so let me clear this thing also for you see when we teach international relations and you study international relations the whole syllabus all although it is divided into four parts bus as far as weightage of class distribution is concerned 70% of the classes you will find will refer to these two segments what is the reason behind it reason is this is the grammar this is the grammar of international relations even issues and topics which are related to these segments even if you want to have a strong insight in in these issues you should have a very thorough knowledge about these segments this will form the base on which you can further extend the uh, infrastructure so this foundation principles foreign policy related developments india's relations with its neighbors this is a big journey and time limit is 1947 till date so various dimensions of relationship right from the time when india emerged as a nation as a sovereign nation state wahan se lekar jab tak aap exam de rahe hain contemporary ekdam real world wahan tak ke every development you need to take care so obviously this journey is huge aapko sara historical everything you need to cover but when you analyze relations of india with prominent countries like us and like russia and other prominent countries or groupings or when you are analyzing these international issues or affairs then your time zone is very restricted this is whole contemporary thing contemporary as in more more or less uh, an examination year 18 months before your mains you should be focused on that you will find questions on developments which are taking place in that time period although it is possible hai ki they there may be some backward linkage attached to that for for the better understanding we might be knowing something but our whole focus will be on contemporary dimensions so obviously the time required to cover such events will be less as compared to covering the events which are in this huge time gap band so that's one thing you should understand ab seen there is a dichotomy we have to spend a lot of time in these two segments but the trend suggests that there were no questions from this segment so that's what i was telling you that candidates they uh, naturally they they got uh like sort of uh, discouraged that we should not give due recognition to this but this year there was a question and it's quite possible it's quite possible that any particular year you you may have all the questions from india's neighborhood because i'm again reiterating that india as a country is pursuing a neighborhood first policy we cannot forget this agar country ki foreign policy mein it's like the the clear cut indication is there that we are giving prime importance to our neighbors then we you cannot skip this thing and you should give proper and due importance to this neighborhood so that's also one aspect and when we are discussing this topical transformation or analysis so we can say that neighborhood as again gained prominence in this year's exam so this is one big change otherwise it's same 
uh, they try to cover every uh, every segment of the syllabus all the four pillars they are important and it will be nice that if they there are four questions there are four pillars so balanced approach should be to take question from every segment but at times it happens they skip a segment and they give uh, some additional weightage to a particular section so that's not uh, something which we should cry upon so this is the third aspect fourth one fourth aspect of this trend analysis is like nature of questions we should also give due importance to this that is there any prominent change in the nature of question which have been asked so again ir is fully it's like a uh, completely contemporary uh, issue so whatever is going on around us in india abroad foreign policy related developments major groupings major upheavals in different parts of the world you have to cover them and this is also being reflected in this year's exam so nature of questions it's almost remain intact and contemporary aspects they are given most importance so this way we can say that in macro trend analysis mostly things are just what they were earlier so there is no major uh, upheaval no major change which we have witnessed in this year's exam now let's move on to different questions which we have seen in this year's exam so the first question let's focus on the first question and i will uh, request you guys please be very careful in reading the question see knowing a subject knowing a topic knowing about any issue is one aspect that's obviously that's important because uh, without that you cannot write anything but equally important is the comprehension part so aisa mat samajhiyega ki comprehension is only limited to your csat it will <laughs> add a lot in your mains exam also comprehension means just like in the law making process you uh, you read that there is a first reading there is a second reading there is a third reading so in similar way you should also be uh, reading the question at least thrice okay focus on keywords focus on the real intent of the examiner because uh, many a times things are not manifested okay they may not be very clear very loud you'll have to analyze and you will have to get to the crux to the soul of the question that's at times i've seen uh, i'll discuss in due course of time that very good candidates but they miss the intent of the examiner and they go on the wrong path and then obviously you won't get good marks out of it look at this question india is an age old friend of sri lanka india is an age old friend of sri lanka this is a statement now we have to analyze that why is this a statement being put up in front of the question discuss india's role in the recent crisis in sri lanka in the light of the preceding statement see it's a very very good technically sound question and i'm sure that most of the aspirants they they must have some sort of uh you can say uh, missing links you will find in their answers firstly try to understand that this statement is entangled with the rest of the question i am using the word entangled although i am borrowing this word from technology you must have read about entanglement in quantum physics the qubits qubits 0 1 they are entangled okay the sim uh, simply i will say 
Entangled means two aspects which are intrinsically related to each other. You cannot think of the other aspect without the prior one. Fine? So, when I am saying that this statement is entangled to the rest of the question, that means if you just ignore this statement that India is an age old friend of Sri Lanka, just for the, for the time being, let us ignore this and let us read the rest of the question. Discuss India's role in the recent crisis in Sri Lanka in the light of the uh, obviously uh, this will also go discuss India's role in the recent crisis in Sri Lanka that's all let's erase everything else then question becomes very straight anyone will be who has written mains this year and obviously we know what all has ha was happening in Sri Lanka all these days people uh, overall <laughs> crashing in the president's palace, they are taking dip in, the, in his personal swimming pool. Obviously, things are quite weird, quite disturbing. So, question on Sri Lanka is uh, definitely it is quite uh, safe to imagine that okay, something on Sri Lanka might come. But, if we look at the intent of the examiner, Examiner is not only interested in knowing that tell me what role India has played in the recent crisis in Sri Lanka. Then the question is more or less like a state civil services examination question. Those who have missed this entangled statement, they will suffer. You have to keep in mind that why is this statement being put up? before the real question and again he has, the examiner has reiterated that discuss the role in the light of this preceding statement. Maybe they have made it clear that you should not miss the preceding statement. Now, what exactly is meant by this? Now, let us decode, let us do the autopsy of this question which is the prime purpose of doing this explanation. Otherwise, all of you are in this digital world with a lot of uh, stuff uh, freely available on uh, on this uh, internet. So, no one is uh, resource scarce, everyone has plenty of resources, but still uh, we hope that uh, we, we will be able to add something to your uh, to your knowledge. Okay. So, here what we can say, the center we can draw that role of India in recent Sri Lankan crisis. There is no doubt that the center uh, nucleus of this question is this, but what is entangled to this keeping in mind the historical relations of India and Sri Lanka. We have to discuss the role keeping in mind the historicity of Indo-Sri Lanka relation. Now, what exactly does it mean? See, we know that questions the easiest way of describing the answer writing is your answer should have an intro, it should have a sound body and then there will be a conclusion. It is like it has become a geometry theorem, every, every candidate knows this. It is an intro, body and conclusion. Now, let us, let us uh, transform the question in this format. When we say role of India, but in the light of historical relations of India and Sri Lanka, let us get into the three parts, three aspects of this question. 
when we talk about this age old friend of Sri Lanka that is this historicity and we have to discuss role of India in Sri Lanka's present crisis, then the moment you give focus to that preceding statement, what should come into your mind is historical role of India in Elam crisis. We all know that presently what Sri Lanka is going through. Sri Lanka ka jo abhi ka crisis hai, that is primarily the economic crisis. Twin deficit problem, physical deficit plus uh, their financial prudence and all those things, the, the policies with respect to agriculture and other aspects, uh, all these things they have created mahem and Sri Lanka is in such a bad shape, we all know that. But a country who is, whose existence, whose financial existence is almost like threatened, when a country goes through a sovereign default, that means the government pledges on bonds and other such instruments, if government says, okay, we are not in a situation to repay the debt, so that's basically a big, big question mark on the financial existence of that country. But the present crisis is financial crisis. If we go in history and we have to evaluate India's role, so this historical role which the question indicates, it will automatically lead to another important role which India had played in the past and that was during this Elam crisis. Now, because of positive, uh, because of this positive of time, uh, I cannot go deep into this Tamil crisis, but you must be aware about this thing that at some point of time since mid 80s till 2009, there was an Elam war going on in Sri Lanka and Elam is basically uh, a political slogan of creating a separate Tamil homeland. So, this Elam was a uh, challenge, it was a clear cut threat, uh, threat to Sri Lanka's territorial, Sri Lanka's territorial integrity. And when Sri Lanka's territorial integrity was in question, there also India steps in. We overall we have taken drastic decisions in our foreign policy, never seen before. You won't find it anywhere in India's foreign policy history that a country is basically going through a civil war like situation and India decided to send its own military to sort out their problem. This is not our policy. India has never opted for such interventions. But Sri Lanka being a nearest neighbor of us, being this historical, civilizational, cultural uh, linkage with this island country, India decided to make an exception to its foreign policy, send its peacekeeping force there. Rajiv Jay Samjhota in 1987 and basically India's contribution, India's such proactive stance, it helped somewhat in resolving the crisis, at least the territorial integrity of Sri Lanka remained as such. Usme koi change broadly nahi hua. So, I will say that although the present crisis is only with respect to the economic spectrum, but the question because of that preluding statement, the prefix which is being attached to that real question, that makes it imperative that we should give due weightage to this Elam crisis 
role also which India had played. So, intro can be this aspect. This will be a very good intro for this question. And this will also justify the uh, real intent of the examiner that being an age old friend of Sri Lanka, you have to discuss some role which India had played in the past also. That will create this historical linkage also that will overall uh, develop a real, you can say, uh, new dimension to this question also. So, that is one aspect which you should keep in mind. The role of India which we have played recently, uh, this is obvious and we will discuss this later. Now, let us come to another aspect because of this historical again role play, which is not manifested in the question, but I think it is necessary to write this thing in your answer. What is it? See, Sri Lanka whenever it is discussed these days and when we are discussing what role India had played. This may a essential feature up ko bilkul dikhega that is China. We cannot just leave China because these China and India in Sri Lanka they are like just become a two sides of the coin. Whenever India's role is discussed. What China has done to Sri Lanka, it becomes imperative to discuss that also. Now, what China has done and how can the historical relation with India, they become important when we see what China is doing to Sri Lanka. China resorted to this debt trap diplomacy. Debt trap diplomacy. Help kar hai, but wo jo debt trap karta ja hai, because of this Belt and Road Initiative and a huge deep pockets of Sri Lanka, of China, which he was utilizing in Sri Lanka also, getting all the ports and the strategic important locations uh, to uh, put up their army there. So this debt trap diplomacy is quite evident. Even in this recent crisis, uh, you must have read in newspapers that China was adamant that their submarine they, it will dock in Hambantota and there was a spy ship also which was in Sri Lankan waters uh, couple of weeks ago and that also was ob objected by India. So, this Chinese behavior and what Sri Lanka has gone through, how China has also contributed to the misery of Sri Lanka, this is also, this should also be a good discussion point in your question and in conclusion you can utilize this aspect that India being an age old friend, we do not rely to such tactics. Our contribution, our role is very rational, very friendly. We do not want to exploit Sri Lanka. If there is a problem, let us screw the nuts. We are not such country. So, that is also one part. So, introduction and conclusion, we will attach both these things with this phrase, we will justify this aspect and then what remains is, what was India's role in the recent crisis? Now, this becomes a very factual question and it is not really difficult to analyze. Let us quickly get into this, what major uh, factors we can obviously use. So, India in Sri Lanka basically, we resorted to a four point package, the four dimensions of our cooperation. It includes a food and health security package. It was somewhat urgent also and in this package, we extended line of credit by India. So, that Sri Lanka will be able to import essential food items, medicine and other essential items. Second dimension of this four point package was energy security package. In this energy security package also it included a line of credit, so that Sri Lanka will be able to import fuel items from India and also from elsewhere and also in this India expedited the help for this Trincomalee tank farm, because that will also induce the uh, energy security capability of Sri Lanka. The third aspect of this 
uh, overall relief package was with respect to currency swap. Currency swap is, basi is basically it's intended to ease out the balance of payment crisis, the Sri Lankan currency devaluation which was uh, taking place. So, this was the third dimension India provided a currency swap agreement and fourthly a very important aspect was to facilitate Indian investments in different sectors in Sri Lanka primarily in the sector of ports, infrastructure, renewable energy and electricity, hydrocarbons, agriculture, education etc. So, India basically resorted earlier to this four point package and you can again diversify or you can classify the more you classify uh, uh, your answer the better it will be for examiner to understand exactly what you want to say. We can say that India's role was also India's role can be interpreted in further two ways. One is with respect to immediate policy, what is required immediately and second one is the medium to long term approach, which will obviously be focused on what? It will be focused on how to basically help Sri Lanka in getting back to the basics. Okay. Whatever basically Sri Lanka is, uh, Sri Lanka wants to re-stabilize its economic and financial needs. Okay. They were in urgent need to go back to their revenue generation exercise. Their forex reserve should replenish all these aspects. So, India's role, whatever we have this four pronged strategy we have discussed, it is with respect to this immediate reaction. But later on, we have also resorted to this long term overall uh, strategy. What is this? So, in addition to meeting the immediate economic and financial needs of the country, Sri Lankan government is in urgent need to revive the revenue generating and forex earning sectors. And what is that sector? Tourism is the key for Sri Lanka. Tourism. It is the backbone of their economy and one of the many important reasons why Sri Lanka faltered in its economic sense is because of this pandemic and what pandemic does to this sector, tourism sector. So, how we can regenerate, how we can again make tourism as a viable sector for Sri Lankan economy, that also comes in the uh, in the policy structure of India. What India basically does in this regard, that is also very important. Three main aspects. India helped in establishing the air bubble arrangement between the two countries and it was in April 2021. Second important intervention was holding of this third joint working group meeting on this issue of tourism and the outcome of these joint working group meetings was inaugural flight from Sri Lanka to Kushinagar that is from Colombo to Kushinagar in October and that helped Sri Lanka a lot in rejuvenating its tourism sector. Fine. Tourism, I would say that there is a this Buddhist tourism circuit approach. And Sri Lanka being a Buddhist majority country, and some prominent, uh, we know that Ramayana, Ramayan trail, and this Buddhist, Buddhist tourism circuit together they can do wonder for both these countries. Tourism can be a big, big thing for economic and social cultural cooperation. So, this strategy to basically enhance tourism in Sri Lanka that also worked well. And that is also one important aspect which we should keep in mind. So, basically what we can say, we can conclude also with this way that India's assistance to Sri Lanka 
was completely in line with its twin track approach of first neighborhood first policy. So, we always want first responder country uh, whenever such challenges they emerge in our neighborhood. India wants to position itself as a first responder country. Secondly, the policy of Sagar that is security and growth for all in the region. Sagar also includes Sri Lanka. So, these twin principles they underline India's emphasis on being a first respondent as well as working in collaboration with other countries to meet the requirements of our neighboring countries like Sri Lanka. So, that is how we can overall write this question and again I will uh, say that the question it look quite simple that ok we have to just uh, explain the role which India has played in the recent crisis, but it is not that you have to add something uh, to justify this uh, original statement which is being entangled with this. So, that was all about this first question. Let us move on to the second question. This question is again with respect to neighborhood, uh, but with uh, particularly in reference to regional groupings. So, question is basically divided in three parts. First part says, do you think? So, first important takeaway is that the examiner is asking about your opinion. So, this is opinion based question, the first part itself. Do you think that BIMSTEC is a parallel organization like parallel organization with SARC? Okay? So, SARC and BIMSTEC are they parallel and there is a deep meaning which is attached to this part which I will discuss later on. So, this part of the question is tricky. Firstly, you have to give your opinion. Secondly, it is a somewhat very uh, sensitive thing that we need to understand. Second aspect of the question refers to the similarities and dissimilarities between SARC and BIMSTEC. This is a plain factual question. Uh, you do not have to worry a, a lot about it. The third part of this question is how are Indian foreign policy objectives realized by forming this new organization? So, we have to overall explain that by uh, helping in creation of BIMSTEC what major foreign policy objectives which India has tried to achieve. So, these are the three associated aspects in this question. So, topic wise or content wise it is not a big challenge in this question, but the real challenge lies in writing this thing in 150 words. So, writing knowing something and writing it in a exact number of words plus minus 10 percent that itself becomes a challenge. So, let us address all these topics one by one. First dimension which is with respect to is BIMSTEC parallel to SARC. And fortunately or unfortunately, whatever way you think, few years ago there was a question on BIMSTEC that was also basically uh, was on the same issue. The question was with respect to that do you think that BIMSTEC F FTA, the free trade area of BIMSTEC, the proposed FTA of BIMSTEC, uh, it looks better than SAFTA that is SARC FTA, South Asia Free Trade Area. So, India was obviously at that point of time and even now India is putting more diplomatic energy on BIMSTEC rather than SARC because SARC is more or less it is like it is not moving anywhere sound of, sort of a deadlock was created in this regional grouping because of Pakistan. So, instead of waiting for SARC to become functional, 
India decided to move on and we engaged our other South Asian neighbors like Sri Lanka, like Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan and we moved forward with BIMSTEC. So, there also in that question also the emphasis was you have to evaluate BIMSTEC FTA and SAFTA. Here also more or less the query remains same that in your opinion is BIMSTEC parallel to SARC. Now, before I will get into how BIMSTEC came into being, what were the reasons, how BIMSTEC uh, comes into existence, before discussing this, let us try to understand this phrase that do you think that BIMSTEC is created parallel to SARC? Something becoming parallel, this is also one scenario of parallelism. If we say this is SARC and this is BIMSTEC and they are equal in length, I am just trying to give you an idea that what what is going on inside examiner's mind, what exactly he wants to fetch out of you. These are two parallel lines. If you say this is BIMSTEC, this is SARC, they are equal in length. So, this refers to in political sense, this parallelism, it refers to replacement of one by another. Iska matlab ye hai ki BIMSTEC ka creation when BIMSTEC was created and the main force behind BIMSTEC was obviously India. So, when BIMSTEC was created, it was sort of India trying to replace SARC by a new organization. So, this, this is one situation of parallelism. But another situation can be, this is SARC, this is BIMSTEC. These are also parallel lines. But obviously, in political terms, if we tr if we want to transcript this scenario, this shows that BIMSTEC is not to replace SARC. SARC is much more important for us as a regional effort than BIMSTEC. But BIMSTEC can also fill in some gaps, which because of you can say non-operational aspect of SARC. So, presently we can get something out of this. This is not replacement, this is technically what we call replenishment. We want to replenish what we are losing from SARC, we want to replenish it with BIMSTEC. Now, these two situations, they are very diverse, they are very different. Parallelism is seen in both situations. So, the first part of question, please be very careful about it. You have to be very clear in your answer that India is not resorting to this kind of parallelism. We, we do not want BIMSTEC to replace SARC. SARC is South Asian regional entity. South Asia means India. I am not saying rest of the countries, they are not important, but in international politics, it becomes evident that a big country like India, when I am saying big, it is big in geography, it is big in population, it is big in economics, it is big in uh, military capability, it is big in soft power, hard power, whatever dimension you take. So, okay. So, South Asia is like India's playground we should lead South Asia and if as a country we want to be a strong entity in world politics, so the essential precursor to that is that we should have a strong say in South Asian politics. So, for that definitely SARC should remain a very viable and a very productive regional outfit. We cannot let SARC die because it will obviously automatically it will also be a proclamation of India's ambition, death of India's ambition in South Asia. 
तो वी वॉन्ट सार्क यह भी जैसा भी है बट वी वॉन्ट टू रिज्यूबिनेट इट वी वॉन्ट इट अ लाइव वी वॉन्ट इट टू बी वेरी प्रोग्रेस सो आपके आंसर में इट शुड रिफ्लेक्ट दैट बिमस्टेक इज अ रिप्लेनिशमेंट एक्सरसाइज इट इट इज पैरल ऑब्वियसली इट हैज समथिंग इट हैज अ लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स विच आर ओवरलैपिंग बट इट इज नॉट रिप्लेसमेंट इट इज रिप्लेनिशमेंट दिस फैक्टर शुड बी क्लियरली विजिबल इन अवर आंसर सो दैट वॉज अबाउट द फर्स्ट पार्ट दैट डू यू थिंक दैट बिमस्टेक एंड साग दे आर पैरल now let's come to the second aspect that is we have to draw some similarities some similarities and some differences you can say or dissimilarities you can say. some differences between sark and bimstick sark and this is a very simple factual question more or less although differences between these two they are quite huge and they are academically they are of much interest to us similarities we can say yes both these efforts both sark and pemstick they have been created to basically take benefit of this globalization era where various nation states they want to collaborate they want to cooperate with each other to get these social economic cultural gains and sark and bimstick their their main spirit basically if you read the charter the objectives you will find that this social cultural economic people to people contact these are the main main aspirations so in that sense they look quite similar to each other okay you can also say that there are many key important countries they are also common in both all the prominent south asian countries they are also participating in bimstick so that's also one important point of similarity but let's focus on the difference part they are more stark and more important difference the first major difference is in the era in which these organizations they have been formed when you will read about regionalism regionalism you will come across that this very important process political process it is further divided into two streams there are two eras of regionalism one is called old regionalism old regionalism the second one is what we call new regionalism old and new regionalism now this old regionalism where a countries of a region they basically join hands they created a regional grouping because their prime concern was security so the key word in old regionalism was security ek region mein jo bhi countries thi they were very you can say very uh, they were threatened about their security concerns so security was one factor which was binding them together so the cohesion tha jo cohesive force thi that was security okay and old regionalism means pre 91 era pre 1991 whatever regionalism was there it was called old regionalism and since sark was formed in 1985 so technically it belongs to this era old regionalism where the prime aspiration for regionalism was security so sark belongs to security but after 91 disintegration of ussr globalization unipolarity all these dimensions so this new regionalism is basically it is an era of geo economics it is about economic interest economics economic issues economic interests they are in the driving seat 
security, politics, they become, uh, they go back. Economy comes in the forefront. So, new regionalism, that is after 91, was focused on economic interest and BIMSTEC was created in 1997. So, it belongs to new regionalism. Now, when we try to establish the differences between SARC and BIMSTEC, this is the single most important, we can say that it is like a very conceptual differentiation of these two on the basis of this era of regional. This is one aspect that you should write. Differences, it also should include one, one very important aspect that is the functional and organizational aspect. Functional and organizational aspect. What does it mean? Spark and BIMSTEC. We differentiate them on the basis of the functional things and the organizational things. The main aspect behind creation of BIMSTEC was failure of SARC. We can say that failure of SARC, failure as in as a concept SARC is still alive, but on the practical ground realities we can say SARC is, SARC has already failed because from 85 till now SARC has not produced anything. South Asia is one of the most poorly connected regions in the world. We don't even trade 5 percent amongst each other. When region like ASEAN, they are having 25 percent trade between them. So, that itself speaks a volume about the failure of SARC. So, failure of SARC leads to BIMSTEC. This is a thumb rule, always remember this. Sark fail nahi hota, Sark productive hota, to probably BIMSTEC would not have been formed. So, that is a reality. Now, agar ek bar humko ye pata hai, ki we have created Sark, we have put a lot of investment in Sark, but Sark failed because of obvious reasons. So, when we go for the second project, second experiment, all these reasons which ultimately led to failure of SARC. Obviously, they should be kept in mind or as a plan BIMSTEC ko kara jayega ki all those things, they should not come in the vicinity of BIMSTEC. So, what were the reasons? SARC failed because of, you can say there was no clear cut functional demarcation that what SARC will do and what SARC will not do. This is very important. SARC mein koi focus nahi tha. Especially the political baggages which different countries they were having. If we want to address why SARC failed, the single most important reason will come to our mind Pakistan. Pakistan ne aisa kya kiya? Pakistan basically resorted to all the extracurricular activities, you can say, Kashmir and all the political problems with India. Just to make uh, sure that SARC should not move an inch further. If SARC succeeds, that will automatically add to India's success. Because South Asia, I have already told you. South Asia is a political theater for India. So, in that sense, Pakistan is hell-bent that do whatever, but don't let SARC move forward. So, this political blickering between India and Pakistan, you can say that was the single most important reason for the failure of SARC. There is no doubt about it. And keeping in mind, when BIMSTEC and its functional and organizational structure was formed, the, all the countries, primarily India, they were cautious that we will not let such things appear in BIMSTEC. 
So the biggest difference is that SARC is a very, very focused, extremely focused effort and there are 14 priority areas. Areas are in front of you. It is counter-terrorism and transnational crime, tourism, environment, disaster management, agriculture, all the, all the positive things which this region, this BIMSTEC is focused on this Bay of Bengal. The name itself, Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. So, Bay of Bengal, oceans, maritime environment, they are, they are becoming the crux of international politics. Okay. So, all these aspects, they may relate to security. Counterterrorism is also there. But, we together we have to work in this area so that we can productively use all these areas. If transnational crime becomes important, if terrorism becomes prominent in a region, you cannot prosper, you cannot grow. So, that is the intent of including this thing. So, in that sense, the clear cut differentiation between SARC and BIMSTEC, which we can see, is SARC is, we can say, it worked like an headless institution, political, all the, you can say, political disputes between countries, they, they uh, frequently, they come in the, in the agenda and that overall backfired for the progress of SARC. But BIMSTEC, just unlike SARC, is quite a focused and priority driven effort. The many very important aspect with respect to BIMSTEC is development of blue economy. Blue economy itself is a very important topic in environment or in economy you might, you must be reading about it. But BIMSTEC, I have told you, it is focused on uh, those countries who are primarily, they rely on Bay of Bengal for transportation and trade. That is the basic concept of BIMSTEC. So, in that sense, blue economy is a very, very targeted and very important functional domain of BIMSTEC, unlike SARC. SARC has not done anything. But BIMSTEC has done something different. They have created this blue economy blueprint, and that is also a very huge connecting dot between these countries. Similarly, SARC in at the organizational level, there is a SARC secretariat in Kathmandu, but all the prior programs and policies, they were in complete disarray. Koi cohesion nahi hai. Secretariat ka koi bhi organizational, koi bada rigid structure nahi hai. Unlike this, you will find BIMSTEC as a very, very conclusive, very strong organizational entity. Right from summit level, that is heads, heads of the state, they meet in this summit, then there are ministerial meetings of various uh, ministries, there are trade and economy ministerial meetings, then there are official level meeting setups, then as you go on, there are business forums, economic forums, so very layered structure, organizational layered structure, periodic meetings, joint working groups, specialized working groups. So, they are working in great cohesion and that is why BIMSTEC is producing the result unlike SARC. So, that is also one big differentiating ground that we should discuss about. So, that is about the second aspect of this question. We can write about these, all these differences. Now, the final aspect is how are Indian foreign policy objectives realized by forming BIMSTEC? So, let us see how we can BIMSTEC and India's foreign policy objectives. So, we have discussed in great detail what all 
foreign policy objective we have achieved. So, the primary thing is we want to take benefit of regionalism, we want to prosper. Okay. India has a dream, we want to be a 5 trillion dollar economy, we want to cross that 10 trillion dollar economy bandwidth. So, we have we are in aspirational state unlike Pakistan. So, ye sare aspirations jo which we have discussed. We want South Asia to move forward, all the countries, all the neighboring countries and Pakistan's, Pakistan's overall obstructionist politics, Pakistan's obstructionist politics. So, India was able to downsize able to halt this Pakistan's obstructionist policy in South Asia particularly through BIMSTEC. So, that is one major objective foreign policy objective that we have met. Then India is having a neighborhood first policy, neighborhood first policy. Obviously, BIMSTEC includes all the possible and probable neighbors which India is having in South Asia. So, all these countries they are getting attached with India in a much much deeper sense because of BIMSTEC. So, this objective is also met. Then you should mention about Sagar. Sagar means security and growth for all in the region, security and growth for all in the region. So, this Sagar strategy also works fine with BIMSTEC because Sagar is primarily focused on these maritime countries which are uh, around us in Indian Ocean. So, mostly these countries they are uh, included in BIMSTEC. So, we are giving impetus to our Sagar policy also. So, that is also one uh, important aspect. Lastly, but obviously is the most important aspect, India's Act East policy whose main ambition is to basically develop our northeast region, which because of this geopolitical limitation of chicken's neck, its overall the development there is lagging with respect to rest of India. So, our Act East policy also uh, gets a fillip because of BIMSTEC. So, that is also one important foreign policy objective which we have achieved. So, in that sense because it is just one third of a question, we, we can add further many things, but these are the most important foreign policy objectives which we have met because of BIMSTEC. So, that is how we can tackle this question on SARC and BIMSTEC. So, the next question is about very recent grouping, grouping as in we can say it is a mini lateral term which was used for this is mini lateral. So, there are trilaterals, there are quadrilaterals and three countries they join hands for any strategic purpose, four countries coming together it calls quadrilateral and these three, four, five country groupings they are technically they are called mini lateral. Beyond this it becomes multilateral. So, this I 2 U 2 grouping the first summit of I 2 U 2 group of these four countries it took place in July 2022 and because of the nature and the scope of this grouping it was considered quite a you can say quite an interesting development especially with country like India included in this along with USA and Israel. So, that makes this grouping very interesting and interestingly this has also become very favorite topic of for UPSC, very favorite topic for UPSC because last year also similar grouping which was created just few months before your examination and question was there, the grouping was AUKUS. So, they have asked question on AUKUS, now this year also 
there is a question on u i 2 u 2. Now, question is comparatively as compared to the previous two questions, the question is very simple. It is a straightforward question, no intricacies involved. Question says that how will this grouping of India, Israel, UAE and USA, it will transform India's position in the global politics. So, how can I2, U2 be transformational for India as you can say as part of India's posturing in global politics. So, we have to address this thing, but before we get into this, you should be able to decipher certain terms like this grouping is focused on the politics of Middle East, Middle East. You must have heard about this West Asia crisis. Because whenever Israel and Arab countries they come in picture, West Asia becomes prominent. Again, since 2020, we are hearing about these Abraham Accords. They have a strong linkage to this grouping of I2U2, Abraham Accords. Abraham Accords, the name itself Abraham, it will lead to further query of what are Abrahamic religions actually. So, that is what I was telling about that although this I2 U2 grouping is a recent contemporary development, but if we do not know what is Middle East, what is West Asia crisis, why these Arab and Israel countries, they are, they are fighting each other for a very long period. What is US foreign policy in Middle East? Without knowing these intricacies, it is very difficult to grasp the real intent of such formulations like I2, U2. So, I will, I won't get into much detail. But these terms I will try to explain in a very, very basic way. So, West Asia, it is a geographical denomination, ok. So, the countries, the all these Arab countries, Iran, Iraq and Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, all these countries surrounding this Persian Gulf, they are western part of Asia. So, that grouping is known as West Asia and there is a crisis between Israel and Palestine and through Palestine all the Arab countries they are a stakeholder in this crisis. So, this whole problem is called West Asia crisis. Middle East is an interesting development. There was a great power game which was uh, playing between uh, these big imperialistic powers of 19th century. So, since 1850, this Middle East, this term was in use and it refers to this great game in this region and the game, game was played between Britain and Russia. So, they want to stabilize their imperial ambitions and the main area was Central Asia. They want to have their footprint, strong footprint in this region of Central Asia. And since Middle East is very crucial for this, for holding this area, so in that sense Middle East becomes also becomes very prominent. So, this great game, it, it finally leads to this term Middle East, but the term was popularized around 1902 by an American naval strategist, a very prominent name, A. T. Mahan, Alfred T. Mahan, A. T. Mahan. He wrote some articles in which this Middle East, this term be became very prominent. So, this Middle East region, this West Asian region, basically it is also the origin of these Abrahamic religions. 
Abrahamic religions, all those religions who owe their origin to Abraham. And prominent among these Abrahamic religions are Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. So, right now we are talking about Jews and Islamic groups. So, Jews they are represented by Israel, the only majority Jew country remained, Islamic, all the Arab world. Okay, so this crisis, the historical, cultural, religious crisis between these two Abrahamic religions and crisis is at many front. The crisis is because of creation of a Arab state, a Muslim state you can say within Israel that is Palestine. So, that is two state formula which Israel also has agreed upon, but still Palestine is not there. So, that is the major crisis. Then Jerusalem is a point of contention. Jerusalem is important for both these religions. They have their very sacred religious places based in different parts of the city of Jerusalem. So, this is considered the most, you can say, explosive, most sensitive global crisis ever. Okay. So, two main participants in this crisis, one is Israel, second one is Arab countries. Arab countries represented primarily by Saudi Arab, Saudi Arab, then UAE. These are Sunni majority countries, they represent Sunni voice. There are, there is country like Iran, which represents Shia voice. And there is further split between Shia and Sunni countries. So, Iran versus these Sunni uh, powers, that is another dimension of this crisis. In this very complex scenario, where Israel is in absolute, they are not in good terms with either Shia countries or Sunni countries, but a new formulation takes place when we heard about this I to U to. These Abraham Accords from 2020 onwards, they have created a scenario where just ignoring this historical rift between these participants, Israel and UAE, they established their diplomatic link. So, that was a big, big game changer in the politics of Middle East. Israel and UAE coming together. Okay. That was the biggest, uh, you, you can say, talking point about Abraham Accords. Here, Israel or UAE ke beach relations ho gaye. It is like ki India, Pakistan, they have established strategic partnership. It is as big as this news. Okay. Now, after UAE, Israel also established relations with Bahrain, then Sudan joined, Morocco joined, a large number of Arab countries, basically they have joined hands with Israel. So, this Abraham Accords, it broke that jinx which was existing in the politics of Middle East and afterwards, after these diplomatic setting up of these enemies, sort of enemies countries. When we hear about this I2U2 formulation, that itself tells that what will be the impact of this grouping on the regional as well as global political landscape. Now, Israel, UAE, they are only two dimensions of this. Rest two countries, that is India and USA. See, this grouping is basically intended to create a platform 
so that Israel and UAE they can have a smooth transition in their relation. Now, since Saudi Arabia is still not part of Abraham Accords, still Saudi Arabia and Israel they don't have normal relations. That is one missing link also. But UAE is equally important, and if UAE is with Israel, then you need some big players who can just smoothen off things if something goes uh, wrong. India and USA, India and USA, these countries they were considered to play this stabilizing role. And this grouping basically it is between four countries, but no wonder Saudi Arabia will also become a part of this some somewhere in future. So India, USA being part of this quartet, this quad, it's also termed as Western Quad. Western Quad. It's also being termed as Middle East Quad. Middle East Quad. So these terms itself suggest that India is definitely taking a large role in global politics because the question was that how does this formation of I2 U2 it basically increases the global positioning of India of India in world politics. So you can very well sense that being a part of such grouping. ये अपने आप में इंडिया का जो ग्लोबल फुटप्रिंट है ग्लोबल पॉलिटिक्स में द फुटप्रिंट विच व्हिच वी आर हैविंग इट्स इट टेल्स अ लॉट अबाउट इंडियाज पोजीशन सो दैट्स द बेसिक थीम दैट आवर आंसर शुड स्केच सो दैट्स द फर्स्ट पार्ट नाउ हाउ विल इट हाउ विल इट एक्सपैंड इंडियाज ग्लोबल पोजीशनिंग देयर आर सम अदर एलिमेंट्स आल्सो व्हिच वी शुड ऐड we should also include india's middle east policy in this question india's middle east policy what policy we were actually carrying out for this region and by joining i to u2 are we seeing any extension to that policy that's also one very important aspect now if we Traditionally, if we look at India's Middle East policy, you will come across a very, a very limited, you can say, limited bandwidth policy. Middle East was always important for India in terms of oil, you can say, energy security, oil energy security. The second dimension of our Middle East policy, or we can say this look west policy conventionally. Our Middle East policy was reflected in this look west policy, which later on being converted into link west policy by including Central Asia also. So, oil is one sector that is that caters to energy security. Second one is the remittances part. The remittances, huge remittances, which we get from this region, because of millions of Indians who were working in Middle East countries. So remittances was one part. Thirdly, the Muslim politics. Muslim politics means India is having second largest Muslim population anywhere in the world, and since these Islamic countries, they Hold a special place in uh, in in the heart of our Muslim population. So sensitivity, extreme sensitivity towards these countries, they are also they also become evident for India's foreign policy. So your Muslim poli uh, politics, this also played a very important role, and this is the limited, you can say, bandwidth which was there in our India's Middle East. Uh, centered policy in the look west policy now by this i2 u2 by joining this grouping how are we stretching this conventional policy this is an interesting discussion see 
in this grouping we are joining hand with israel in a very in a very aggressive way in a very active way ab india israel relations they are also very interesting india is having diplomatic relations with israel since 1992 way back just when we opened up with the new economic policy in 91 we also gave diplomatic status to israel but this was like a very shaky very introvert very shy foreign policy towards israel none indian prime minister visited the country who was considered one of the most important strategic partners for india especially in technology and in security related dimension okay so that was the level of you can say resistance 2017 Prime Minister Modi became the first Indian PM to visit Israel. That itself tells a lot about paradigm shift in India's approach towards this Middle East. We don't want a zero-sum game approach in West Asia. कि भाई इजराइल के अगर पास हैं तो अरब कंट्रीज से हम कहीं we want to just push them away. No, we don't. We we don't have an inch, even an inch of change in. our foreign policy towards palestinian cause we are still supporting palestinian nationhood two state solution india's foreign policy is exactly it's the same no change in that but still we have moved much closer to israel and the beautiful thing is the balancing is ki israel ke sath jab aapke relations itne ek बहुत ही अनफोर्सिंग एक उसमें है द सेम थिंग अप्लाइज विद अरब कंट्रीज इंडिया सऊदी अरब रिलेशन इंडिया यू ए रिलेशन प्रेजेंटली दे आर ऑल्सो इन द गोल्डन फेज सो दैट काइंड ऑफ फॉरन पॉलिसी एडवांसमेंट दिस इज रिफ्लेक्टेड इन आई टू यू टू अब ये चीज और भी ज्यादा प्रोमिनेंट हो जाएगी कि हम यू को भी इसमें रख रहे हैं वेन इजराइल एंड यू आर कमिंग टुगेदर सो द पैराडॉक्स विच इंडिया वॉज ऑलवेज हैविंग दैट वैनिशेज दैट इवेपोरेट्स एंड दैट बेसिकली हेल्प्स अस एज अ कंट्री कि वी कैन परस्यू इवन मोर एग्रेसिव फॉरेन पॉलिसी इन दिस वेस्ट एशिया रीजन बिकॉज इट केटर्स टू अ लॉट ऑफ डिमांड फॉर इंडिया इट्स अ टेरिज टेररिज्म हॉट स्पॉट a lot of technologically technological security related inputs from this region a lot of investment can come from this region so all these things they become very important and this additional or you can say expanded this uh, global footprint that's also is quite evident by india joining this i2u2 grouping so that's also one important aspect beyond this we can always say that okay so what we can say in this uh, particular if you want to summarize it that how is this geopolitical implications of india joining i2u2 we can club it in two three points that i2u2 would certainly help america reframe its middle east policy and india being an integral part of this policy so india will also have an expanded footprint in the region indo us partnership will also get an expanded overview because now us is partnering with india beyond its asian interest that is beyond indo pacific beyond indo pacific so the original quad which was which is focused on indo pacific now this western quad that further expands india's positioning in the world politics thirdly we can say I2U2 offers an opportunity to deepen our ties with Middle East, so that's also one additional thing which we have just discussed. So in this sense, definitely we can we can overall address uh, this issue that by joining I2U2, it overall enhances India's position in the global politics. So that was all about this question. now let's move on to the last question uh that's about clean energy so this is the final question 
this is paper. Clean energy is the order of the day. Again, just like the first question on Sri Lanka, the statement which was given in the beginning. Describe briefly India's changing policy. India's changing policy towards climate change in various international fora in the context of geopolitics. Now, more or less question was a straight and simple, but there is little bit trick which was provided in the question that was with this word geopolitics. See, this question can also be like, it can also be analyzed in a very simple way that describe briefly India's changing policy towards climate change in various international fora. When we say international fora, it is like the biggest one is UNFCCC, which is conducting various COPs, Conference of Parties, COP26, Glasgow Summit, which took place recently. So, the question was primarily hinged to this contemporary event, Glasgow COP26 summit, that is ok. Then G20 is becoming very important for climate change related discussions and deliberations also. So, UNFCCC, G20, then India has basically overall masterminded and is a very pivotal force in creating this international solar alliance. So, all these forums, groupings, they are discussing about this climate change politics and the stand of India in recent times is definitely there is a sharp change, a, a paradigm shift we can say. So, that is the crux of the question, there is no doubt, no doubt about it. But equally important is this statement, why is this given? that clean energy has become the order of the day. This is not just a common, you can say, a dictum that, okay, everyone knows that uh, now it is time to talk about clean energy, okay. Just get rid of these fossil fuels, everyone knows. But why is this statement given? Because we have to correlate these two things, that now India has understood the, the essence of this thing that we cannot just ignore this problem, just like other countries also. This has become the order of the day. We have to change ourselves, even if we are justified in our stand, but still change is needed. And you have to mention the changes which we are witnessing in India's climate change policy in various international forums, but we have to substantiate that what geopolitical compulsions are there, which basically leads to this change in India's foreign, India's uh, foreign policy towards climate change. So, this is the complete dimension of this question. What changes we are witnessing? The geopolitical factors which are causing these changes and obviously, this is the, you can say the base of the question that India has realized that it is time that we should also move forward with this clean energy options. Even we are burning coal, never like before, but still in the equal, you can say equal space, we have to develop this renewable energy sources, the cleaner energy options that is also become very evident. So, this is the whole, uh, we can say context of this question. Now, let us analyze this climate change politics and India's stand. Because change, if we want to see the change, then we should be knowing what was our original stand. Then only we can analyze what changes are we witnessing right now. So, climate change politics and India's stand. Point. So, this whole thing basically, let me go through the slides. Yes, one more thing. In this question, this word geopolitics, which has come and I think 
most of the new uh, students, new aspirants, they might not be aware about this. So, it is better that I will give you a brief about this term also. Geopolitics in the simplest way impact of geography on politics. If you do not know anything, do not get into complexity, just see this. Whenever in understanding, in analyzing politics, in international politics, in analyzing foreign policy, when you are giving key importance to geography, which geography which leads to a certain kind of political behavior, that way of thinking is what we call geopolitics. Rudolf Jelen, the famous Swedish political scientist, he overall gave prominence to this word in 20th century, although uh, the, the word may not be uh, like very glamorized before that, but even in Plato, Aristotle, even in Cotillia's political writings, you will get the essence of what geopolitics talks about. So, word was, you can say it was pedicured, manicured by Rudolf Jelen, but the spirit, it was, it, it existed before this also. Geopolitics can be described as study of the influence of such physical factors as geography, economics and demography upon the politics and especially the foreign policy of a state. This is what we call geopolitics. Now, we have to basically discuss the climate change politics and the role of geopolitics in the changing climate change politics. That is the crux of the question. Now, conventionally, when climate change politics it was developed and primarily the first major representation of climate change politics was with Kyoto Protocol. And Kyoto Protocol basically talks about this concept of dichotomy, dichotomy differentiation. You must be aware about this concept of CBDR in environment, you must have studied this. Common but differentiated responsibilities. This CBDR, it became the backbone of climate change politics and it was in Kyoto Protocol it was manifested in a big way. Okay? Now, what was this dichotomy? What was this CBDR? The dichotomy was created between developed countries and developing countries. Okay, problem was aggressive, tha. problem was immense, tha. problem was like it was threatening human existence on this planet. So, obviously while discussing the causes and how can we get rid of this problem, this nuance. So, it was decided in Kyoto Protocol that a dichotomy should be developed, should be made between developed countries, developing countries and that overall was the responsible factor behind policies of countries like India. Climate change mein India ko kya karna hai? What as a country we should do? It was, we have devised our strategy as per this dichotomy. Puri, the whole world agreed on that. Okay. So, India's policy was that developing countries, they will, they are, basically they will be participant in this fight, but the problem was created because of developed countries. So, they should be, they should owe this historical responsibility and they should work. Uh, right now, they should work, they should curb their emissions, they will uh, provide climate finance to the third world countries, they will help in mitigating the effects of this uh, greenhouse gas emission. Sari responsibility developed countries ko primarily the day. Developing countries, they were, it was, it was a general thought that in future they will also join hands and they will also do what is required out of them. But this dichotomy basically with time it became evident that this dichotomy is unrealistic, it is divisive, it is obsolete and also it is ineffective. Now, this 
पूरी जर्नी में जो रियल जियो पॉलिटिक्स दैट बिकेम एविडेंट इट वॉज विद रिस्पेक्ट टू चाइना बिकॉज डाइकोटमी वॉज क्रिएटेड बिटवीन डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज एंड डेवलपिंग कंट्रीज एंड इन डेवलपिंग कंट्रीज चाइना वॉज ऑल्सो डेवलपिंग ऑल दीज अरब कंट्रीज दे वर ऑल्सो डेवलपिंग इंडिया वॉज ऑल्सो डेवलपिंग ऑल दी एफ्रीकन लैटिन अमेरिकन कंट्रीज एंड एट सम पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम इट वॉज सीन लाइक दीज कंट्रीज दे आर बेसिकली दे आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर रफली फिफ्टी एट परसेंट ऑफ द एमिशन so obviously you can't just let them do what they are doing okay because then everyone will stop contributing and exist existential threat is not only on developed countries it is much more severe for developing countries so keeping in mind all these factors china at some point of time decided that i will no longer be a part of this dichotomy चाइना ने अपनी पॉलिसी चेंज कर दी चाइना सडनली चाइना ज्वाइन हैंड्स विद यूएस दैट ओके क्लाइमेट चेंज पे आई डोंट थिंक व्हाट कंट्रीज लाइक इंडिया व्हाट दे आर सेइंग आई एम विद यू आई विल आल्सो मिटिगेट आई विल आल्सो कट माय एमिशंस आई विल डू व्हाट एवर डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज आर डूइंग दैट वॉज अ बिग जोल्ट बिकॉज देन द प्रेशर ऑन कंट्रीज लाइक इंडिया इट बिकेम वेरी इमेंस क्लाइमेट चेंज टॉक्स में इंडिया एक तरह से पूरा आइसोलेटेड हो गया वी वर ट्रीटेड एज अ विलन दिस कंट्री इज नॉट डूइंग एनीथिंग एंड दैट वाज द रियल यू कैन से रीजन दैट वाज द रियल कॉज दैट इंडिया हैड टू ट्रांसफॉर्म इट्स पॉलिसी बिकॉज नाउ जियो पॉलिटिक्स वॉट चाइना वॉज डूइंग अमेरिका अमेरिका विद्रू फ्रॉम पेरिस क्लाइमेट कॉन्फ्रेंस दैट वॉज अ बिग जियो Uh, you can say stress point so these are the reasons which finally led to india's change in climate change politics although hum abhi bhi humko ye ye points hamare favor mein hai ki abhi bhi india ka emission it is just about 1.5 tons per capita and overall if you say us it is 20 tons per capita so almost 12 13 times larger than us an average indian overall contribute 1/13th of what an average american contributes to this problem so all these factors but primarily because of chinese behavior and what china has done all in all these years china is basically troubled with this concept of carbon tax because china believes that if, if in in lieu of in the uh, garb of this whole climate change related threats if west anyhow these western countries who basically are losing their supremacy to china also economically if they impose this carbon tax then chinese economy will be ruined so is is uh, fear se ki कार्बन टैक्स लग गया तो मेरे इंपोर्ट एक्सपोर्ट एवरीथिंग विल बी लाइक फिनिश्ड बिकॉज दिस टैक्स विल वर्चुअली किल चाइनीज इकोनॉमी इट विल बी सच अ ह्यूज डिट्रीमेंटल इंपैक्ट ऑन चाइनीज इकोनॉमी तो कार्बन टैक्स को देखते हुए चाइना एकदम से यू टर्न लेता है एंड दे चेंज देयर पॉलिसी एंड दैट फाइनली ओवरऑल फोर्स इंडिया ऑल्सो दैट वी शुड चेंज आवर पॉलिसी नाउ the main emphasis of this question was on what are the changes because the geopolitics and the reasons behind changes they only contribute to a small way so change can be two things because the question again you have to write in 250 words so there is a scope but not much scope so i will suggest that you should focus on two dimensions first major change it was witnessed in 2015 when india first time india talked about its indcs that is intended nationally determined contributions so india overall proposed its indcs in 2015 there were eight goals but prominent 
amongst these were the three quantitative goals. Given quantitative targets, it's a very tough thing to do. Qualitative, you can say anything, okay, in future, India will try to minimize its emissions. This is a qualitative thing. How much we will reduce the emission, nothing concrete is there in the policy. But once you put up the quantitative targets that we will reduce this much in this much time period, then it becomes a big commitment. So, out of these eight goals, India overall provides three quantitative targets. You should write these three targets also. You must have read them in your environment class. Cumulative electric power installed capacity from non fossil sources, India has pledged that it will reach to 40 percent. That means the cleaner energy options will make 40 percent of the total energy output. That is a big, big challenge which India undertook. Second, INDC which India announced that we will reduce the emission intensity of our GDP by one third roughly 33 to 35 percent compared to the 2005 levels that is also a considered being considered a big uh, gesture and the third final target was creation of additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of CO2 equivalent through additional forest and tree cover. So, these were the three quantitative targets. Change in policy in these targets which you should keep in mind that India resorted to the national determined contributions for the first time. Before this India was like stressing on the point that uh, dichotomy that it is not our fault, we have not contributed to climate change and developed countries should do everything. So, this big change was evident in this. Even bigger change during this Glasgow summit, when our Prime Minister talked about this Panchamrit. Panchamrit, it is one of the most important things. You should memorize all these five points. They will be important in future prelims and other exams also. What are these Panchamrits? These are all monitorable quantitative targets again. First one, 500 gigawatt of non-fossil electricity generation capacity. Second, 50 percent of total energy use will come from renewable sources. Third, net greenhouse gas emissions will be 1 gigaton or lower. Fourth, emissions per dollar worth of GDP will be lower by 45 percent by the year 2030. And last, Panchamrit or five nectar principle is perhaps the most crucial commitment was that India will achieve net zero by 2070. It's the most ambitious thing which we have pledged that India will become a net zero polluter, net zero emitter by 2070. Now, this is in sharp contrast to India's posturing that keeping in mind that India has just begun the journey of development. We cannot provide you the time limit when we will peak in carbon emission because we do not know the growth trajectory of India as such. There are roughly more than 350 million people who are succumbed to this multidimensional poverty scenario. So, how can India provide a peak year presently? That was our stand few years ago, but with Panchamrit, India also overall bypassed that, that thing and we also have announced that we will become net zero by 2070. So, these are the prominent changes and we have also discussed about those geopolitical factors which basically leads to these prominent changes in India's climate change politics. So, that was all about this year's international relation based questions in mains examination. I hope and I am sure that you will definitely, you must have gained something out of it. And I am again reiterating this thing that while attempting civil services mains question, 
do a lot of hard work in in comprehending the question because there were two questions in the beginning which if we miss those forward and backward linkages then probably uh, that won't uh, that uh, that will create a lot of problem for us so best wishes for you in all your endeavors thank you so much for joining thank you